Amen. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes. And one thing is absolutely true, that is, the Christmas spirit is the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. Amen. All right, let us, let us pray one more time. Lord, our Father in heaven, how wonderful, how great, how holy is your name. Father, you have provided us everything that we need. You've given us eternal life. And Father, you have given us this wonderful time of year where we can come and celebrate, Lord, as we look forward to celebrating the birth of Christ. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just uh, bestow your Holy Spirit upon us. And Father, that you would just uh, give me the words to speak, Lord, today. And just bless us with a heart of understanding. And lead us in the direction we need to go. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Presenting Jesus. That's one thing as a church that we need to make sure that we do. That's one thing that as individuals we should do in our life. And, and this story, presenting Jesus. It brings us to one of those, well, there are actually there are several of these in the Bible. There are events that happen, and you can see as this event unfolds in the Scripture, it is a meeting place of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it gives us the relevance today to recognize and see Jesus as the point of focus that we all must look about. So our Scripture will be in Luke Chapter 2, verse 21. Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. And we read there, And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called, called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. So looking at our scripture this morning, we have a few points that I want to mention about this scripture. And this scripture, it, it is like a crossroads, if you will. First of all, there is a, a promise of peace. A promise of peace. And then we see, as we look in this, in this psalm, in this, in this song, if you will, that Simeon gave, a few words at all significant. There is also, in addition to a promise of peace, there is a sight laying eyes on, a sign of salvation. And then there's also Christ the cause. So let's first look at the promise 
of peace. Now, if you see in that sign, you say, well, yeah, that's a crossroad. And this event that happens early in the Gospel of Luke is indeed a crossroads, because what's, what's going on here? Well, we see that Mary and Joseph, the earthly parents of Jesus, have had him circumcised on the eighth day, eighth day, and then on about the 40th day after his birth, they bring in the baby Jesus to the temple to present him as the firstborn son. And this has a lot of relevance and a history in and of itself. So what's going on here? How does the Old Testament come into this crossroads where we're talking about a promise of peace? Well, God's mighty work had, if you look at the Old Testament, the defining story of the Old Testament, if you will, was God bringing the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt in judging the nation of Egypt and simultaneously taking Israel, his chosen people, bringing them out of that captivity by many strong works, by a miraculous hand, and bringing them forward to the promised land. And that was in fulfillment of a great promise of peace. The promise that God had made way back yonder to Abraham. And even to Abraham, God gave him a forewarning and said, Now, your, and your descendants are going to be captured by a nation and they're going to be slaves to this nation for a while, but then I'm going to judge that nation and I'm going to bring them out. There was a promise of peace. And God has given us a promise of peace this morning if we will look to the same Jesus that's being presented in the temple. There in front of everybody. Jesus is being presented as was the custom for the firstborn sons. The very first word of Simeon's psalm in verse 29, in some versions of your Bible it will say, Lord, in other versions it will say, Sovereign Lord. And the reason for that is the Greek word is not used too often about God. It is used a few times. It is a Greek word, this despotes is where we get the word despot, We're talking about a dictator. But the negative connotation that we have with that word of despot, we think of a tyrant, we think of a, a, a ruler who has gone power hungry and mad, is not in this word. Think about when, when you see sovereign Lord, think about a God who controls all of time, all of history, and all of the universe. In fact, in Acts chapter 4, we see a prayer that the early church was making and, and they prayed and they used the same word. They said, Lord, you created everything. Sovereign Lord. Lord, it's in your hands. And Simeon, as he holds this little baby, he says, Lord. But what were Mary and Joseph doing there? Why had they come to present Jesus? Why would you take your firstborn son, if you were an observant Jew, to the temple, your firstborn son, and present him to the Lord? It was something they were all supposed to do. And it was commanded back in Numbers, in the Old Testament, chapter 8 and verse 17. For all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both of man and of beast. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated them for myself, and I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel. Remember the story of how God judged Egypt. Remember the Passover story. The Passover story was they took the blood of the lamb that they were to consume, and they put the blood over the lintels of the door. Nobody was supposed to go out. Because the angel of death was coming through all of Pharaoh's dominion. And the firstborn, not just of not just of man, but also even of beast, the firstborn were all slain. The Bible says there was not a household in all the land of Egypt where they didn't wake up and somebody was dead. Because God's mighty hand moved in 
judgment and took out the firstborn. His judgment upon the unbelieving Egyptians for all their hostility and aggression and enslavement of God's people. That generation was gone and the Lord told him, he said, now every firstborn among you is special. The firstborn of your animals, you'll either redeem it or you'll sacrifice it to me. The firstborn of all your children belong to me because I, in my great power, brought you out of Egypt and that was the price that they paid. The firstborn of mine. And then later on, the tribe of Levi, the Levites, remember they were the priestly tribe. They were the temple workers. It was only that tribe that was allowed to minister in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And here's why. They were called out for special service to God and it was in place of all of the firstborn of Israel instead of my firstborn son being dedicated to the God and going off to work in the temple, we're going to take the Levites instead as a tribe. They're going to stand in for you, but still, your firstborn are special to me. And Moses gave this commandment, and that's why Mary and Joseph had come. Now, the reason they come when, when they did, remember they had circumcised Jesus on the eighth day per the law. They called his name Jesus. But then about 30 odd days later, it was another Old Testament commandment that Mary and Joseph were careful to obey. And this is from Leviticus 12, 6 through 8. For a period of some days after, a woman's birth, she was considered to be ritually unclean. In other words, she couldn't come to the tabernacle yet until this time period had been followed and a, a proper sacrifice brought. It was different for girls and boys. For boys, the period was about 33 days after the circumcision. And then after that period was over, the woman, the new mother, brings the baby and these sacrifices. And when the days of her purifying are completed, whether for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting a lamb a year old for a burnt offering and a pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering. And if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her, and she shall be clean. In other words, now she is ritually clean. According to the law, she can resume worship in the tabernacle. So this is what they're doing. Now we present our firstborn son, and we present our, our burnt offering and our sin offering. Now, since Mary and Joseph are not wealthy, the Lord, in his consideration, allowed uh, pigeons to be offered in place of the lamb to save money for those who were not of means. So this tells us that Mary and Joseph were not financially very wealthy. But in terms of righteousness, they are fulfilling the law, doing just as the, the law commands. And they have brought Jesus, the firstborn son, the only begotten son of God also. They're bringing him to the temple and they are presenting him. Here he is. Who walking by would know that of the many couples who probably showed up on this day, this was not uh, a, a unique event. It was being done all the time. But this one particular couple here bringing their particular baby and this particular baby is Jesus Christ the Prince of Peace who is being offered in place of our sins but he's being presented to the world a promise of peace because our wickedness our sin of all mankind dooms us 
to being condemned by God for our transgressions. There are none who have not sinned. All are guilty in the eyes of God. There is no peace for the wicked. So the only way that we can have peace is to come to Christ Jesus, who is the offering of our peace. And here comes Simeon. Lordy, look at all who have missed this event. The scribes and the Pharisees had no idea. King Herod had no clue, although sometime after this, the wise men would come. They didn't show up on Christmas Day. Remember when Herod tried to kill the babies, trying to eliminate the true uh, son of David, he sent after the two-year-olds and under. So this was probably before the wise men and all of that, right? However, here's Simeon. And for some reason, he's there. And I want to get on board with Simeon today because one thing we have lost sight of in the rush, we have lost sight of in the hustle and the bustle and all our plans and all of the crowds in this world and all that occupies our minds, we have lost sight of the Prince of Peace and the promise of peace. But somehow Simeon found him. How did he do it? How can we do it? And when Simeon holds the child, he says, Sovereign Lord, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Who can say, well, I can die in peace. Doesn't everything in our body, doesn't all of our instincts say, I'm supposed to fight. I'm supposed to stay alive. I don't want to die. I don't know what, I, I'm scared. But here this man was, and he had a promise of peace. Somehow he knew that on this particular day, the baby Jesus, the Savior, would be there. And he got tuned in, and he got clued in, and he found peace. He found enough peace. He could say, Lord, this is the moment I've been waiting for, the consolation of Israel. The Redeemer is here. Now I can die. He knew. He had that confidence. How did he know? The promise of peace. How did he know it? It's the next thing is the sight of salvation. This crossroads is not only where the Old Testament meets the New Testament. And the law and the prophets and all the sacrificial system is coming together in this little tiny drama that nobody much is paying any attention to. Here in the corner of the temple, here comes Jesus' parents and the baby Jesus, a little over a month old, being, being presented at the temple. And here comes Simeon, who has the sight of salvation. Church, we need the sight of salvation. Now, what on earth, what on earth allowed Simeon to have this sight or insight? We can look in the scriptures and maybe find a few clues. It says in verse 25, now, now there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. So the scripture gives him some points. He was righteous and devout. And to me, you look at those two words and you can see righteous meaning that he didn't steal from his neighbor, he didn't commit adultery. In other words, in dealing with, the, with his fellow man, he followed righteousness. And devout, meaning that he was tuned upwards to the Lord as well. So he was serving the Lord. He was living righteously with his fellow man. Well, is this why? And I would say, no, that's not the real reason. That's good. The Bible talks of several like this. Zacharias and Elizabeth. 
You know, they were upright before God. But he had the sight, the sight of salvation. And there's a, a, a scripture about that. What the sight looks like. What are we seeing when we see salvation? I'll tell you what we're seeing. In John 1, verse 29, John the Baptist was ministering, and it says the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 2020 spiritual eyesight, brothers and sisters. Because the sight of salvation is the sight of the Lamb. If you can lay eyes on Jesus, if you can see him for who he is, if you can see that he has come to sacrifice himself for our sins, if we can put our faith and trust in him, and then we have the sight of salvation. Behold the Lamb of God. Is there anything better we can do? Is there any more constructive witness than what our lives can do if we can be pointing and say, Jesus, over there, there he is. Our lives should point to Jesus. Our church should not be about elevating a pastor. Our church should be not about congratulating ourselves for being holy. Our church should be about pointing to Jesus. Oh, Simeon saw it. God had given him the promise of peace. Simeon, before you die, you're going to see the Messiah. And then he said in verse 30, For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. The sight of salvation. Simeon said, I have seen it. We've been studying, Chad's been leading us in the book of Jonah. And there were a lot of things in Jonah that God prepared, right? God prepared the storm that assaulted the ship that Jonah was on. God prepared the big fish or the whale or whatever to gobble up Jonah to keep him safe. God prepared the great big gourd plant that grew up to shelter Jonah when he was stationed outside of Nineveh, hoping it would get destroyed. God prepared the cut worm that cut off his shade to teach him a lesson. And here, Simeon says, my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people right here in downtown Jerusalem in the middle of the tabernacle where everybody could see, not only that, in front of the whole world. Jesus was being prepared. Salvation was being made ready. Some of my favorite words in the English language are, honey, I'm fixing dinner. <laughs> Don't we love it when things are prepared for us? When things are made ready. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Isn't that wonderful? He's gone to prepare us a place. Why? Because salvation has been prepared in the sight of all peoples. Now, many felt that the Jews were part, they themselves felt they were part of an exclusive club. Why, we are the sons of Abraham, goody, goody. And our genetics guarantee that we're not going to no bad place after we die. In fact, in some of the rabbis' tradition, they believe that Abraham himself was stationed at the gates of hell, if you will, or Sheol, where they, the dead went, just to make sure that no uh, Jewish ancestors uh, were sent in the wrong direction. They were so sure that their heritage, that having Abraham as their father guarantees them salvation, they didn't need anything else. But the sight of salvation is not who your mom and daddy are. 
The sign of salvation is not having your name on the church roll. The sign of salvation isn't some checklist you can keep in your mind and say, you know what, if I have more plus marks than X marks, then I'm a shoe in. Sign of salvation isn't negotiating your way past a supposed St. Peter stationed at the pearly gates. Doesn't happen like that. The sight of salvation is laying eyes on Jesus. Well, you might say, well, that's great. All I've got to do is look at Jesus and I'm going to be saved. Wonderful. Except we're born blind. John chapter 9 to me is one of the most touching chapters in all of the Bible because it tells the story of a man who was born blind. And he was outside the temple area, probably not far from where Jesus was here being presented. But years after this, when Jesus was ministering and his disciples walked by and they see this poor blind beggar, and the disciples want to know, and they said, well, Jesus, how awful, look at this guy. He, he, he was born blind. He, he's never laid out of his mother. He's never seen his father. He's never seen the light of day. How terrible. What awful sin did he do? Or maybe his parents did some awful sin that he can't see. And remember what Jesus said? He said, it's not that he was a sinner necessarily or his parents were a sinner, but so that the glory of God can be revealed. And little by little, you read through that chapter and you see that Jesus reveals himself to this blind man. Now, he gives him sight physically, but also begins to instruct and tell this blind man who he is until finally the blind man realizes that, hey, here's the Messiah. But church, I'm telling you, how can we see Jesus if we're born blind? And we are, every last one of us. Blind in our sins. Jesus said, you have eyes to see, you cannot see. You have ears to hear, you cannot hear. So we need something to happen. And that is the real reason that Simeon was able to find Jesus. Because you know what? He found Jesus the same way we do. He was led by the Spirit. That's how we find Jesus. That's how we see him. No man can come unto me unless the Father who sent me draw him, Jesus said in John 6 and 44. And you go back and you read, and, he's, and sure enough, the Holy Spirit was upon him, talking about Simeon. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. I don't know what Simeon was doing that day, but one day, whoosh, the Spirit descended on Simeon. Whoa, what? what? Simeon, time to go to the temple. Well, I, I went to the temple to pray. It's time to go now. And off he went. Led by the Spirit, through that crowd, how on earth did he do it? The Spirit directed his steps, and he saw a young husband and a young mother and a little baby, and the Spirit was right there. Simeon, you know that promise I've been telling you about? Right there. Simeon, you know that salvation you've been longing for? The consolation of Israel? That brings us to the last point in Simeon's encounter, and that is Christ, the cause. Christ, the cause. In other words, Jesus is making something happen. Jesus is causing a decision point for you and me today. Christ is causing that. What brings about this decision? Verse 35. 
we remember Simeon and the temple and it is a warm and fuzzy scene. Well, this, this particular verse is not warm and fuzzy at all because Simeon tells Mary, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. A sword in Mary's heart. What on earth was he talking about? Well, what he was talking about was nothing short of the cross. The cross. This is the first reference in the Gospel of Luke to that certain faith that Jesus would meet. He's only a month old, folks, and already the cross is looming ahead of him. The cross is the greatest test that mankind will ever face. Because the cross asked us the simple question, what are we going to do with Jesus and the gospel? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12, verses 23 and 24, sums it up for us. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. In other words, some look at the cross and they say, you crazy Christians are just, you're out of it. Why does some man dying on the cross 2,000 years ago have anything to do with me? How is that anything to do with salvation? And let me tell you, folks, that has everything to do with salvation. Christ crucified. To the Jews, it was a stumbling block because they just could not accept that their beloved Messiah was supposed to die on that old rugged cross and shed his blood. They were looking for a conqueror, a hero who was going to set them free from Roman rule, bring them back to the glory days of David and Solomon's kingdom. Well, Jesus is coming back one day. And he won't be coming as a babe in a manger. And he has called us, church, to have eyes to see. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. We're studying Proverbs on, on Wednesday night. We've been talking about wisdom. The Bible says the fear or the respect and the reverence of God is the beginning of wisdom. Seeing Jesus... Asking him into our heart as our Savior, realizing what he's done for us, repenting from our sins and wickedness, turning from that to serve the living and true God, that is salvation. So by way of invitation, I invite you to basically follow the same path that Simeon followed, and that is don't die without seeing Jesus. Don't die without confessing him as your Lord. The Bible says every day will bow. We'll recognize him one day, every single one of us, every, bo every boy and girl, every man and woman that's ever lived is going to acknowledge Jesus Christ one way or another. You can acknowledge him as your Savior or you can acknowledge him as the ultimate judge. It all comes down to what we do with the cross. Don't leave here today if you haven't found that perfect plan of peace, the promise of peace. If you haven't set eyes on the Savior, don't stumble over Jesus except him. he is the true cornerstone. Let's pray. Lord, Father, today as we have come to the hour of decision, Lord, I just pray that you would move on every heart. Father, that you would prepare us to receive your word. Lord, I pray that whatever burden any might have, the altar is open for them to, to pray and to receive guidance and, and, and comfort from the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, move indeed upon us, bring us closer to Oh, perfect us in your kingdom.
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all.